He claimed on his deathbed that this stained glass window held his own series of clues to where the Ark of the Covenant was hidden. Like a scene from the Da Vinci Code, legend hunters are on a quest to find none other than the Ark that held the Ten Commandments. The clues are so cleverly disguised. Why go to all that much trouble if they weren't trying to hide something of great religious importance? A fascinating mystery for this diverse team. A historian, an actress and model, and even a member of the pop group Air Supply. We have something here that, that the Knights Templars seem to have found in the Middle East. Where will this ancient mystery take them? All the clues point to the fact that there's something underneath the ground. Oh, well. Wow. Oh, my God, that is it. My name is Graham Phillips, and I am the Legend Hunter. Warwickshire, England, an idyllic rural county of rolling hills. Famous for being the birthplace of William Shakespeare, it's also a treasure trove of stately homes and medieval churches, complete with secret crypts and religious artifacts. But what if one of the greatest of all relics were hidden here? What if the Ark of the Covenant was brought to Britain centuries ago, its location unknown to anyone but the dead? The Bible tells us that Moses brought the Ark of the Covenant down from Mount Sinai. The golden vessel held the Ten Commandments, but it had immense powers of its own. It is written that divine fire emanated from the Ark, like rays from a high-powered laser that could destroy anything in its path, including entire armies. The Ark was lost somewhere between the 6th and the 10th century BC, but rumor has it that a mysterious religious and military order known as the Knights Templar found the Ark. That's what Graham Phillips is betting on. I've spent time in the Middle East researching the story of the Ark of the Covenant, and it seems that it was discovered by the Knights Templar at Mount Sinai in the 1180s, and it was brought back to England by them. Graham Phillips is a historical detective. With several books to his credit, he's known as England's Indiana Jones. I used to work on the road as a salesman, and I used to travel from place to place and spend most of my nights in bars, in hotels, with nothing else, with nothing else to do. So I decided to get interested in local history so that when I would turn up at a new location with a night with nothing to do, I would investigate the local churches and, and other monuments and try and find out the history behind them. He has circled the globe in his never-ending quest to solve the mysteries of the past. His latest obsession, to find the Ark of the Covenant. From his research, he believes the Ark was found by one of the Knights Templar, who later settled in the county of Warwickshire, Graham's first stop. And then it's a case of uh, following a, a trail of historical clues. Hi. Hello. Lynn. Hi. I'm nice Graham Phillips, and you're Clive. Yes, yeah, that's yeah. right. Very pleased to meet yeah, you. Yeah. Well, thanks for offering to help me. It's, um... it's all our pleasure. The trail starts with Lynn Picknett and Clive Prince, experts on the Knights Templar. In fact, one of their books inspired the Da Vinci Code, which features the mysterious knights. They were kind of the special elite forces of their day, and they were enormously um, authoritative, enormously wealthy. In the early 1100s, the Knights Templar were formed by a group of knights dedicated to protecting the Christian pilgrims. This group lived as monks and soon evolved into a Christian army, defending the Holy Land. 
As their power grew, monks weren't the only members. Soldiers and adventurers from across Europe were attracted to the Knights Templar, and by the late 12th century, it had become one of the wealthiest and most powerful organizations of its time. There was a, a kind of hard core within the Templars that were using the order for, for other means, to acquire knowledge, to acquire power, to acquire wealth. Obviously, looking for the Ark of the Covenant with this, you know, uh, uh, the, the supposed great power in battle is something that would have appealed to a military order. The idea that they went searching for it does make um, a great deal of sense. And for those reasons, uh, basically, the Templars became associated with treasure. After almost 200 years, the Templars were disbanded by the church and the king of France, fearing they had become too powerful. But that didn't stop them from holding on to their wealth. And. What happened was that the legend says that at this time they hid their treasures, which presumably included the Ark of the Covenant. Mm. In fact, Templar writings speak of one treasure that was so important it was never called by name. Graham believes that treasure referred to the Ark and that a group of Knights Templar hid it somewhere in Warwickshire. But exactly where is the big question. So this is where you come in. Um, I have found out that, that this particular group, after the Crusades, returned to England, specifically to Warwickshire, in the centre of England. But whereabouts in Warwickshire, I have no idea. Lynn tells Graham that most of the Knights Templar settlements contain the word temple, so Graham needs to find a town named in that way. You can start by narrowing it down by place name. Because basically, a, a clue is if a place is called temple or incorporates the word temple, because that shows Templar ancestry. After scanning a map of the area, Graham spots a place in Warwickshire that fits the bill. Hold on, there's one here. There's a Temple Hardwick. Hurdywick? There's a temple there. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a good place to start as anywhere else. Graham dives into researching Temple Herdwick. Luck is with him. Graham finds that the group of knights that protected the region in Israel, where the Ark was supposedly hidden, settled in Temple Herdwick upon their return to England. Everything points to this as the right location. Wasting no time, Graham meets again with Templar experts, Lynn and Clive, to share his results. You're absolutely right. There were Templars there, and in fact, they are the ones I was looking for. But Temple Herdwick is only the first piece of the puzzle. Graham learns that those particular Templars then move to another location in Warwickshire, the Burton Dasset Hills. There, they built a church, which, legend has it, is full of mysterious clues regarding the whereabouts of the Ark. Especially fascinating are a set of decayed paintings inside the Burton Dasset Church. In the 1890s, when renovations of the building were taking place, behind the plaster work, they found all these incredible murals, paintings. Were the murals merely decorative? A local historian named Jacob Cove Jones believed they were actually much more, the key to a secret coded message. So once the plaster came away, although they were in pretty good condition then, enough for this guy Jacob Cove Jones, a local historian, to examine them and, and come to the conclusion that they were the Templar code mm. to the Ark of the Covenant. Since that time, they've badly crumbled away, and, and this is all that's left. Photographs of the 700-year-old murals show they framed a window that looks out onto another mysterious Templar landmark. The only other part, the only other thing that the Templars left in that area that still remains is on the hill here, on the Burton Dasset Hills, they're called, is this strange-looking building here, known locally as the Phoenix Beacon. Mm -hmm. It was uh, erected by the Templars for some unknown purpose. Mm -hmm. um, the general consensus is that it was used for religious ceremonies of some kind. Mm -hmm. For more than a century, it has been rumored that Cove Jones actually deciphered the clues leading to the location of the Ark. Graham needs to find out more, and his luck holds out. Cove Jones's great-great-granddaughter lives just a few kilometers away.
legend hunter Graham Phillips has come to Warwickshire, England on a mission. His quest to find none other than the Ark of the Covenant. He's discovered strange murals in a Templar church, murals that a local historian, Jacob Cove Jones, believed contained a code to the Ark's whereabouts. Graham Phillips hopes he'll find out more at Eddington Park, where Jacob Cove Jones lived 100 years before. And he's lucky to find someone who can help. Ah, Angie. Hello. So you're Jacob Cove Jones's... Great-great-granddaughter. Great-great-granddaughter. Yeah, right. I think I might have problems remembering. Angie is equally fascinated by her family history. He was an, an historian and he spent most of uh, his family money on uh, historical mysteries, researching historical mysteries. And the, the last one that he, he was doing was uh, trying to track down the Ark of the Covenant with the clues left by the Knights Templars. In fact, Eddington Park was once owned by direct descendants of the Knights Templar. And just like the nearby Burton Dasset Church, it is filled with Templar symbols and decorations. Graham gets a tour of Jacob Cove Jones's inner sanctum. So this is where Jacob Cove Jones studied. And this is where he actually worked? Yeah, this was his library and this, this is his picture. Oh, that's him? Yeah. Wow, so what I really need to know is, do you know anything firstly about the, the murals in the Burton Dasset Church that he thought were the clues as to the Templar's treasure, the Ark? Yeah, I know he did believe that um, the Burton Dasset murals contained clues left by the Templars to the whereabouts of the Ark. He, uh, um, but he, other historians didn't really believe him. So did you know if he actually solved those clues? Um, he claimed that he had decoded the clues, yeah. In fact, on his deathbed, Cove Jones told everyone he had made, in his words, a discovery of immense importance. He didn't leave any writings, and the decayed murals of the Burton Dasset Church reveal nothing to Graham. So I've reached a dead end. Well, not really, because he did leave his own set of clues. His, his own set of clues? Yes, he, he decoded the Templar's clues, and then not telling anybody about it, he, uh, he had a stained glass window made and installed in a church in Langley. And, uh, Langley, which is not far from here? Yes, and, um, and, he ha and the clues are in that window. Hold on, let me get this right, sorry. He's, he sold the clues that are in the Burton Dasset murals. Yeah. He doesn't tell anybody. He knows where the Ark is, but for reasons best known to himself, he doesn't go and look for it. Yeah. And he leaves his own set of clues as to where it is. Yeah, in the stained glass window in Langley Church. Is it still there? Yes, yeah, it's still there. Can we go and see it? Yeah, we can go there. Let's go. OK. So this is the, this is the church. I thought it was going to be a bit bigger than this. No, it's very small. It doesn't take long to spot Cove Jones's window. The size of it surprises Graham too, but it's crammed full of fascinating symbols. It's, it's called the Epiphany Window. The Epiphany is the 12th night of Christmas, the 6th of January. And it's when the three wise men visited baby Jesus and gave him their three gifts of gold, frankincense and myrrh. So, have you any idea why it doesn't show the Ark of the Covenant? I mean, have you ever... I mean, any idea why it shows that particular... No, none whatsoever. And if the window does contain clues, I wouldn't have the first idea of how to begin deciphering them. What these clues might be, I... It's, it's difficult to tell, but firstly, you've, you've, you, you, it doesn't show the Ark of the Covenant. It shows the three wise men visiting the baby Jesus on Epiphany Day. It's actually called the Epiphany Window. And Epiphany Day is the 6th of January. How did they find Jesus? By following a star. Should we be following a star to lead to where the Ark of the Covenant is hidden? Is that what he's trying to tell us? In fact, stars have important associations to the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark had two angels carved into it, and angels were thought to be embodied by stars in the heavens. The Ark's particular angels were associated with the stars Bennett Nash and Mitzar. Could that be what the letters B and M in Cove Jones's window stand for? Is there a time on Epiphany Day which we should be observing these stars? Well, yes, there is. Here we have a cock crowing and the Christian tradition is 
that a, when the wise men were guided to Bethlehem by the star, the exact location of the whereabouts of Jesus in the, in, in the stable was finally revealed when a cock crowed at midnight. Is Jacob Cove Jones trying to tell us that at midnight on Epiphany Day, you should try and observe the two stars, the two tail stars of the Big Dipper, Benetesh and Mitzar. The next question would be, where would you observe it from? Then, Graham has an epiphany of his own. He remembers the mysterious Templar structure near the Burton Dasset Church called the Phoenix Beacon. Could the Phoenix depicted in the window refer to the Phoenix Beacon? Could that be the place to observe the stars? And if so, what could this observation tell them? Something else which is really interesting, this really weird shaped um, object here, which is presumably supposed to be one of the wise men's gifts of gold, frankincense or myrrh, is almost exactly the same shape as that beacon on top of the hill. So, go to the beacon on top of Burton Dasset Hills on Epiphany Day at midnight, see exactly where those two stars are. Do they point to a place on the horizon? Is that where we're supposed to go? And when we go there, what are we supposed to find? But stars are aligned differently at different times of the year. Graham has to figure out the position of the stars as seen from the beacon on the night of the Epiphany. And once he has the position, what will the stars point to? Should he look for the ark or a red archway as shown in the window? There are more questions than answers. Now, having looked at the window, I'm going to have to try and I'll have to sit down and try and work out uh, if there really are any clues in it or whether it's just a, a family legend. Um, my friends uh, who have helped me out before investigating uh, historical mysteries, Graham and Jody from the States, are coming over. We're here at last. Uh, yeah, we're here. From Holland. Graham is eager to share his theories of the Epiphany window with them. Jody and Graham Russell have worked on other cases with him, researching the lost city of Atlantis and the legend of Robin Hood. But it's just a sideline of theirs. Graham Russell is a songwriter, singer, and guitarist for the pop band Air Supply, and Jody is an actress and model. I've always been interested in, you know, the heartbeat of life and what really is, is the purpose of everything. And so when Graham and I went to England nearly 19 years ago, we were very fortunate to meet Graham Phillips. And we were very much in, interested in the same things that he was, and it just kind of fell into place. And for some reason, when the three of us are together, it's not even like we consciously even think about it, but when we get together, something happens. I mean, there's nothing really as exciting as solving a clue, but then ultimately finding something. Is, is a great reward, you know, not for oneself, but this has nothing to do with any monetary value. It's just uh, realizing that somebody from centuries ago hid these things and they hid them for a reason, you know, and you've got to find them. And it's, it's uh, part of the whole treasure. The treasure isn't finding it, it's the, the pathway to finding it. Right. Before long, the team feels confident they know what Jacob Cove Jones was trying to say. Together we've examined the epiphany window, or photographs of it, and we've pretty much worked out, I think, what the clues represent. The team decides the two stars in the window are key. They point directly to a red structure of some sort, surely another important clue. That the window depicts the epiphany is also significant. It pinpoints January 6th as the time to observe the stars. Finally, the illustration of the phoenix is telling. If it refers to the Templar's Phoenix Beacon, that's reinforced by the shape of one of the wise men's gifts, which mirrors the mysterious structure in the Burton Dasset Hills. The Phoenix Beacon is the name of the strange conical round structure that the Templars built on top of the Beacon Hills behind their preceptory, their chapel. So I think that's where we've got to go on the 6th of January and look at the stars. But they can't wait months for January 6th. Luckily, Graham knows someone who can change the stars. Traveling through the English countryside, legend hunter Graham Phillips is hot on the trail of the Ark of the Covenant, the vessel that once held the Ten Commandments. 
He's sure that the symbolic clues left by a historian in a stained glass window 100 years ago will lead to the Ark. He's especially interested in the two stars depicted in the window, but he needs the very specialized help of an astrophysicist at the University of Hertfordshire in Hatfield. We're going to go now to the University of Hatfield Science Department, where an astrophysicist by the name of Dr. David Pinfield is going to use the planetarium there. David. Hello, Graham. Welcome to the University of Hertfordshire Science Learning Centre. And it's here that you have the facilities to be able to show me the stars at, uh, on any day of the year, at any time. Yes, we've got a nice planetarium here that you can use. The university houses one of the few computers in England capable of showing the position of the stars on any date, past, present, or future. The planetarium is a very useful device for working out visually where the stars are at any time of year and seeing how they would appear to someone standing in the, out in the middle of a field, for example, uh, in the middle of the night. Graham wants to know the location of the two stars Bennett Nash and Mitzar at midnight on January 6th as seen in Warwickshire in 2006. He believes they will point to the location of something historian Jacob Cove Jones wanted found. What he gets is a spectacular light show. Now I can use my remote control to uh, bring up the locations of, uh, of the constellations. There they are. Oh. Does that have their names on it anywhere? Can you let their names come up? Somewhere? I can bring up some names as well. And here are your two stars. Ah, there they are, yes. Benetesh and Mitzar. Those are the two stars that were identified, and they're, they're pointing almost straight downwards. Well, I can give you a grid that would be useful here. Right. So if I press this button here, the grid appears. Oh, wow. And you can see that over there to your left is, uh, is north. That's north. But could Cove Jones's clues have referred to January 6th of another year, 1907, when the stained glass window was installed, or 1350, when the Knights Templar left their clues? Graham needs to get those coordinates as well, just in case. This is back 1352, um, 1350, 51, that's roughly around the time, that's when the Black Death was in England, that's when the Templars left these original clues. So these are the stars at 12 o'clock on the 6th of January. This is how it would have appeared, yes. It's pretty much the same place. It's a very similar position, but it's ever so slightly different. So, you can, can you make the print out of that as well, the position? So that uh, I yes, I can do that for you. Ah, oh, that's fantastic. OK. David, thanks so much. It's a pleasure. Meeting up with Jody and Graham Russell at the Phoenix Beacon, the team gets to work. With the aid of their star map from the year 1350, they plot out the two stars' positions in the sky. By dropping a line from the stars to the horizon, they pinpoint a little place they have never been to before, Chapel Green. And when we get there, our only clue at the moment to what we're looking for in Chapel Green, where the Ark may be hidden, buried, or whatever, is um, some kind of red brick structure which is indicated in the stained glass window below the two stars. Looks like some kind of red brick arch is a prominent feature there. So I don't know, maybe it's in a building somewhere. That's what we're looking for when we get to Chapel Green. And we're going there tomorrow. First thing the next morning, the team is on its way in search of a red brick structure. Well, we will know it's around here somewhere, right? Yeah. Suddenly, Jody can't believe her eyes. Hang on, hang on, pull, pull over, pull over. I think I just saw something like a, a red arch. The team of Graham Phillips and Graham and Jody Russell have been traveling across the English countryside in search of the legendary Ark of the Covenant, hoping that clues found in a stained glass window will lead to the ancient relic. Now, they've arrived at the village of Chapel Green, looking for a red structure matching the one in the window. Jody can hardly believe it, but she has spotted something almost identical. What, there's nothing yeah, back, here? Yeah, back up, Graham. There's nothing? No, a little thing, just a little thing. What? It looks just like this. Back up. 
I can't See? stay too long on the curving. Right there. Oh my god. Look. I can't see it. Anymore. What is it? Oh, oh wow. I'll try and pull up, pull up over there. Yeah. That is it. Yeah, darling, pull up over that there, is and then that, we can, we can really it. go what back is it? and look at it. I don't know, but it looks what just like there? this archway, and it's well, red, and it's red. It is red. Yeah, it's I know. Be I just, I didn't have a good look at it, but no. it, what the hell is it? It's just on its own beside the road. Yeah. Oh wow. Oh no, this is this is exactly I mean that's gotta be it. But well, I was expecting a big arch. Well I was expecting a castle. <laughs> well no, I mean the arch itself is part of something else, like a a, a church or something. Right. Okay. Examining the arch, the team decides it's a drinking fountain, certainly dating from Cove Jones's day. This is a Victorian thing, I reckon. You can tell by this like red brick. If the Knights Templar hid the Ark anywhere, it would have been on hollowed ground. Since the area is called Chapel Green, it stands to reason that a chapel once stood there. So the fact that they found a drinking fountain is significant. Old chapels in medieval times always had a holy well attached to them, which is a natural spring, which was considered to have curative properties. And very often, in, uh, when these fell into disuse, in later times, springs or drinking fountains were built over them right. and this could be very one such thing i mean this is, looks victorian to me right and this has got to be what he was alluding to yeah now yeah. could this behind here have been if that was the original holy well with that little drinking fountain red big arches then the chances are that the chapel would have been there well how do we find out about it i mean if there was a chapel here how do well, we go, go about let's go ask the farm i mean the farm where's the farmhouse for this that must be it there it's got to be here Graham asks one of the local farmers, who confirms his suspicions. A chapel did stand there at one time, built under strange circumstances. When they came to build the original church here in Chapel Green, overnight the stones were mysteriously moved to the top of the hill in Nupton, and the next night they were moved back. And um, so they then built the original church on top of the hill. So that was, that was the legend, and mm. that, that could basically relate to this area here. I mean, yeah, the somewhere in Chapel Green. Graham checks out the landscape. The field has never been excavated, and that gives Graham hope. He calls his friend Malcolm Wheel, a radar technician with Geophys Limited, who has special ground-penetrating equipment. Hi there, um, it's, it's Graham. Yeah, I, I, if you're working nearby um, where we are, we're just near Southam in Warwickshire. That's right. Do you reckon you can get over here this afternoon? Oh, here's Graham and Jody. Graham. Soon, Malcolm Wheel arrives with his radar equipment in tow. Can your equipment find out if there could have been the remains of a chapel there or anything? Yeah, we're, we're going to use the radar. We're going to we're going to do this little field here. I mean, it's probably about 80, 90 foot long by 30 foot wide. We should do that in two or three hours. Graham's quest is approaching a turning point. Is it possible that he really has discovered the location of the Ark of the Covenant in the middle of the English countryside? Believing they have found the place where a medieval Templar chapel once stood, Graham Phillips, along with his research team of Jody and Graham Russell, are convinced this is a site of great significance. With the help of Malcolm Wheel's ground-penetrating radar equipment, Graham hopes to find the Ark of the Covenant buried deep beneath the ground. I've looked for lots of strange things, and I mean, the Ark of the Covenant could be here. It's not been discovered. so. It could be here, it could be anywhere. But based on what Graham's told me, there's a very good chance that we could actually find something. We're going to use the very latest ground radar here, and we're going to send 40 electromagnetic pulses into the ground that, sh that will go down about 18 metres. And if there's anything in the ground, like any buried objects, like metal objects or foundations, the, the radar signals bounce back from that, and we build up a 3D image of what's actually under the ground. 
But after several hours' work, there is nothing to be found. I was hoping that there might be an outline of walls to show there was originally a chapel there, foundation of stones, or even better, that there was a large object, metal object, golden object, that could have been the Ark of the Covenant. Unfortunately, there was neither. That There is no evidence from that ground-sensing radar, which seems to be able to go down to 18 meters, that there was no foundation stone. Refusing to give up, Graham surveys the area. The they have overlooked the obvious. Here. There is another place the chapel might have stood, in front of the drinking fountain rather than behind it, where they had been searching. Right now, it's a paved road. But when this road was modernized years before, a lot of earth had to be removed, and any trace of the church would have been removed right along with it. I want to try and find out where, well, I, where the rubble went that they dug out. Was it chucked there? Was it chucked there? So perhaps we could actually look through that rubble. There is the chance the earth was moved nearby and that the remains of the chapel might still be found. I'm going to have to try and find out somewhere in the area where this rubble went to. I'm going to ask around. So if you can perhaps go and uh, look around to see if there's any other clues on, in the stained glass window, pictures. Right. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. Um, if you any of, um, we're just doing some research about this that little drinking fountain that's over there. All right. Yeah. Next to the next to the road. Yeah. Have you any idea when this road was widened here and, and sort of metalled over? Yeah. Um, I think it was about the 1950s. The road was widened and, and tarmacked over. But what we wanted to know really was like the rubble that was dug out to, to make way for the road. Have you any idea yeah. what happened to it? Um, yeah, yeah, do it. It was used um, in a field just over there to, to uh, dam off a stream, so to sort of divert it. So it was taken over there, so it's not too far. Could you like, point out where it is? Yeah, it's literally, so I see the house there. Right. It's a couple of fields over from there. OK, then, cheers. Thanks very much. No problem. Graham brings the news to the rest of his team. Hey. Well, hey. I, right, I found out that the rubble from the road but some guys told me that it was used to divert a stream. Oh, wow. In right. the fields just over there. Oh. So I think we need to sort of check that out, really. But, I mean, it's getting on a bit, so... It's going to be dark soon. Perhaps we do that tomorrow? Okay. Yeah. OK, then. Cool. Cool. Okay. Let's go. The next step is that myself and Graham and Jody are going to have a look in that area, try and find that rubble that originally came from in front of the arch here to see if at least there's any evidence that there was a chapel there, perhaps finding stones from the original chapel, and that's our next stop. The next day, as Graham Phillips and the Russells approach the farm, their excitement grows. I managed then to check out with the county records department early this morning and found out exactly where this rubble was placed. This is the spot here. So this is where the uh, rubble was apparently used to uh, sort of shore up the embankment. Ah, uh, yeah, look, hang about. There's something here. These. Wow. That is definitely a cut stone. That's not a natural definitely. one. Definitely. So that has what come is... from the rubble under the road and, and have these as well. This could very well be one of the stones from the original right. chapel. I think we must I think we're right. This is this is promising. Well, and these are definitely not naturally formed. I mean that's perfectly square. Graham thinks it's a sure sign they found the remains of the old church from Chapel that's Green. See, this is what I was hoping was going to be found under the ground in that field, but it's clearly now uh, obvious that it, was, it was, un moved. was under the road, like I suspected all along. If they have indeed found the remains of the chapel, pointed to by the clues in Cove Jones's stained glass window, the team may also have found a direct line to where the Templars kept the Ark. The trio splits up to cover more ground. Hey, Graham, come and have a look at this. What's that? Look at these markings here. They look like they're man-made. Ah, 
They are. Is it a lot of them? Yeah. Something. Yes, Please. look. These here, right, this is the kind of um, ornamentation that was a zigzag sort of thing that you right. get around pillars on old churches and chapels in medieval period. Like a joint, yeah. joint them together. Oh, wow. The, these are definitely the stones from, a, from an old medieval building. I'm telling you, yeah. we found our chapel. Great. It was <laughs> taken from underneath that road and it was right. dumped here. So this is the chapel. I mean, we're on to something. Oh, great. This so it wasn't is a dead chapel. end. No, Yay. absolutely. It was under that road. Then, as the team continues to search, Jody once again makes an extraordinary find. Guys, I think I found something. It looks like it? It, yeah, it looks like it's got something. Look, wow. it's got something carved on it. Oh, Jesus. After scouring the English countryside for the location of the mysterious church they believe once held the Ark of the Covenant, Graham Phillips and his researchers, Jody and Graham Russell, have made a startling discovery. They found the site where the church had originally stood, but this location had been dug up and used as landfill decades ago. Could this rubble still hold clues to the Ark's whereabouts? While combing through these ruins, Jody Russell stumbles onto something that stops the hunt in its tracks. Guys, I think I found something. It looks like it? It, yeah, it looks like it's got something. Oh, that's a shaped stone, written right? Something on it. Yeah. Look, see, it's perfect. So square. We we'll try to dig it out. Wow, it is square. That is definitely yeah. That's a that's a man-made stone or a shape. Yeah. See, it looks like it's got something that's etched in it. Is that right in it? Yeah, see that? It's coming Does out. It come it's like out? a slab. Be careful. Oh no, I will. Careful. Right. Wow. That's definitely a that's definitely a part of a, a building or something. Oh, it's too perfectly square, isn't it? Yeah, but probably. it's still rock. Oh, it's amazing how long that could have been sitting here. Oh, look, just sticking out. Awesome. I mean, that's what I saw was that sort of that it looks like a those are a, letters. Hold almost on. like a Y. I could see it. That, there's a Y. That could be an inscription from like, maybe <gasps> off the off the chapel wow. wall or or grave marker. Is maybe. it Latin? Hold on, we'd have to clean this up. Let's get this. Hold on, don't do too much to it. We can go, okay. We've got those brushes in the car. We can clean it up. Okay. And I've, I've, that that is that's, that's a Y. That's definitely something, isn't it? A quick look reveals that the inscription is written in a language that the team is not familiar with. If they could decipher it, it might provide proof of the origins and purpose of the church. This could give us a real, real strong um, piece of evidence that this is from the original chapel that was at Chapel Green. Graham contacts a linguistic expert. It's not Roman. Remember the linguist that I said that uh, was an expert on European and Asiatic languages? Mm, sure. Um, I sent her a email with a picture of the stone, mm -hmm. and she's really quite excited. And she said that uh, she wants to meet with us and basically tell us what she thinks it is. The expert has told Graham she has photographs of script that look very similar, but hasn't told him anything else about the markings. At the moment, she's at the Shrewsbury Museum, about 30 miles away. Mm -hmm. So we could go there this afternoon and uh, she'll reveal all to us. But she, apparently she's very excited. Gila Kalimi is an Israeli linguist, an expert on the origins of Middle Eastern languages. After examining the piece, she has come to a conclusion about its origins. And it's what Graham and the Russells have been waiting to hear. So Gila, as I was, I was saying to you on the phone, what we thought about this stone is that it was probably brought back by the Templars from the Middle East, because it's certainly no form of writing that uh, would have been used only ecclesiastically in a British church. So it's not like Latin or it's not Greek. I mean, if it, we're thinking it may come from the Middle East and it may have been something the Templars brought back with them. So 
do you recognise th th this script at all? Is, I mean, is it, for example, any form of Hebrew? Well, it wouldn't be Hebrew as we know it today, uh, as the Hebrew we use today was formed around 950 BC. Right. Uh, but this looks like what used to be um, the Proto-Sinaitic uh, script that would have been used around 1500 BC. And well, this, is, this is an early form of Hebrew? It is. Right. Yeah. Um, if you look at the stick man, right. uh, for example, that would have represented uh, the letter He in right. the Hebrew alphabet. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, you've got this thing here, uh, which would have represented the letter Yod. Right. In the Hebrew alphabet. And then you've got the, uh, this letter, uh, which looks like the Greek letter Epsilon. Right. Uh, which would have represented the letter Vav. And, and what, does those, what does that mean? It's actually very interesting, uh, because one of the names of the God of Israel, right. uh, one of the probably most important ones uh, mentioned uh, in the Bible, uh, would have consisted of the letters uh, Yod, He, Vav and hey, again. So this could be talking about God in an early form of Hebrew? It could be. I mean, there's the idea here of uh, God outstretching his arms uh, to man. So you can probably see some kind of a so this, connection there. You'd, you'd put this, you'd, you'd got this up here at first when you'd seen this earlier, and you'd yes. said this was something, is this, this the proto, what do you call it? Proto-Sinaitic. Proto-Sinaitic Sinaitic. script. Yes. And this dates from when, do you say, about 1500 BC? Yes, this was found in, a, in the Sinai area, uh, a place called Serabit El Qadim. Uh, and if you look at uh, some of the symbols, uh, they oh, are this is identical similar, to if not Oh, yeah, we were wondering right. about that. That's that. right. And the it, stick man. That's right. I mean, you have to appreciate that uh, the proto-Sinaitic script uh, hasn't been uh, completely deciphered. But so, could, could but this sandstone, we know this is sandstone, but could this be from the same area, from the Sinai wilderness? I is would that say, possible? Yeah, I would say by the colouring on the stone. Because it looks very, it very, very similar. Very similar to this one that you The styration. Hold on, there's, there's something, there's, sorry, there's something that just struck me, right, about this, is that, right, you're saying, for, firstly, that this is some early form of Hebrew that predates Hebrew as we now know it. That's right. So before 950 BC. Right. Wow. If, and... And this this text comes from Sinai wilderness. The Sinai, mm -hmm. yes. Sinai wilderness. Well, isn't, isn't that we're talking? This might sound a bit crazy, but the Ten Commandments were supposed to be in the Ark of the Covenant. Yes, and right. they were supposed to be. They, they were made from the rock from Mount Sinai, and they were made at some point around about 1350 BC, when Moses was kicking around. Right. I mean, was this the kind of script that was in use at that time? Yes, it wow. should have been, it would have been. Graham may have gotten in deeper than he expected, much deeper. Is it really possible that he has discovered a piece of the most holy artifact of Western civilization, the Ten Commandments? He pauses to question what they've found. Could the Templars have faked something like this? No, because the Templars wouldn't have known how. What would they have they written would have used, They would have used Hebrew. As we now know it. Yeah. So they this, so this kind of old text wasn't rediscovered until more recently in archaeological That's right. time. So it's definitely not a fake. It can't be a fake. I, my assumption would be no. It can't be a fake. Well, it, this is absolutely fantastic. I mean, I bought the stone for Gila to have a look at because I thought it might have been some medieval text dating uh, coming from the Middle East, but Gila suddenly identified it as an early form of Hebrew called proto sinaitic which was the early form of Hebrew that was used before 950 BC, you know, a couple of thousand years almost before the Templars, well, over a couple of thousand years before the Templars. Um, and it was, the, it was the writing that would have been actually written at the time of Moses, say, 1350 BC. What's more incredible than that, it actually originates from the Sinai wilderness, Graham Phillips has reached the end of this particular search. The stone tablet must be subjected to rigorous analysis to determine its true origins and meanings. That could take a long time and still prove inconclusive. 
but Graham and his team are even more enthusiastic than before, and they aren't about to stop hunting. I am going to continue the search for the Ark of the Covenant, and we've got to keep searching because somewhere in that air, at the end of that trail of clues, mm. the Ark is waiting to be found. I agree. Oh, absolutely.